A very good morning everyone. Unfortunately, I can't be with you in person today, but I know you'll have a very productive session during this Rural Ideas Forum. Today's event allow us to bring people of all walks of life together and discuss some of the key challenges and opportunities facing our rural communities. This is also an important occasion in our ongoing engagement with the rural stakeholders and citizens as we continue to to roll out the government's rural development policy, Our Rural Future. This is an ambitious plan for rural Ireland and one which has already had a hugely positive impact in communities, towns and villages across the country since its launch in 2021. Today we focus on the theme, the future of social enterprise in rural Ireland. And coming from a rural background myself, I know the value that social enterprises can bring to communities. In 2019, the government demonstrated its commitment to the sector by publishing Ireland's first national social enterprise policy. This policy has focused on three main objectives, building awareness of social enterprise, growing and strengthening social enterprise and achieving better policy alignment. Since the policy's introduction, we have implemented a multitude of measures to grow and strengthen social enterprise right across the country. We are now developing our new social enterprise policy, which we intend to complete by the end of the year. To inform this process, my department has already held stakeholder town hall type engagement events across the country. We have also had many bilateral discussions with social enterprises and their advocates and with other government departments. The new policy is also being informed by two important pieces of research. Firstly, an OECD review of social enterprise in Ireland, which is due for publication shortly. And secondly, the baseline data collection exercise of social enterprise in Ireland, which I recently published and which will form part of your discussions today. But today we want to hear your views and ideas and we would particularly like to hear your views on matters that may be specific to rural social enterprises. Viewing the issues through a rural lens will support the rural proofing of the new policy. This will help ensure that both the needs and strengths of rural communities are fully considered. Today is your opportunity to bang the drum and tell us what else you believe needs to be done to create an even better environment for our social enterprises. I leave you with a final note of thanks for participating, particularly the speakers for today's event. Your views are so important as we work together to continue to develop the social enterprise sector in Ireland. So have a great day and a really positive engagement and exchange of views. And I look forward to meeting with many of you again very soon. Guramila Mahagiv Guler. Okay, so I will now get up our next uh, presentation and then uh, shortly we'll hand over. I'll just, yeah, just let you know when I have that up. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Hello, folks. How are you doing? Um, first off, welcome to everyone on the floor for attending in person here today. And then uh, to everybody online, we have about 70 uh, in here today physically and somewhere around 100 online. Um, we have a really diverse and knowledgeable group of speakers here today. And I know through having chatted to a few people beforehand, uh, the audience is equally as um, as knowledgeable. Uh, attendees from all corners of the island, from Kerry to Antrim, Donegal to Cork, have we heard, came up from West Limerick, myself this morning. Um, maybe first, just to introduce myself and the DRCD team, Rob Nicholson is my name. I joined the department in April from the Department of Housing. I have responsibility for social enterprise and rural strategy. Um, 
to an extent still reading myself into the brief, but my background is in the community and voluntary sector and in local and regional development. So on the rural side of the team, we have Melissa and Andrew here, whom I'm sure many of you will know already. Um, uh, I, uh, Andrew Ford was my predecessor. So as I say, I, I've taken over from him. And on that side of the ship, we have um, John here and Anne and Richard, unfortunately, isn't around today. So just to kind of circulate, and we'll be furiously taking, taking notes as, as, as we go through today. I have a few colleagues online as well from, from the various units. Um, the most important thing I'll say here today is it's over to you because we're not going to say too much effectively today is to hear the voices of the speakers and yourselves in terms of what you think we should be doing to ensure that the uh, forthcoming social enterprise strategy reacts to the needs of rural social enterprises. And that's essentially um, what we're here today to do. Uh, personally also obviously to, to put some faces to names and so on that I've seen. So I'm really looking forward to that. Just on the location, I'm conscious we're in and just off the main street of the most urban location in the country. Um, I suppose it's fair to say we do two things. We frustrate half the audience uh, having an event like this in Dublin um, because it's urban. And when we go to a rural location, we frustrate half the audience because they have to get to an area that they find it very difficult to get to. So what we decided to do was kind of rotate, annoying you. So the next time around, it'll be the urbans that will uh, be more frustrated with us. So just very quickly in terms of a context setting effectively for yourselves to understand where we're coming from. As you know, absolutely the role of social enterprises is growing and it's only going one way. That's the one thing I've picked up since I started from EU policy, OECD policy and locally, uh, the development of the sector and the wider social economy sector beyond social enterprises is only growing. It's in the space between national economy, obviously, and local communities. It services marginalised groups and effectively a, a large cohort of the sector is subcontracting what would be otherwise public services. Um, However, on the enterprise side, it also very much concentrates on creating jobs and innovation in the social area and environmental area and so on. Um, as I say, we have very recently just got a new social economy strategy in from Europe, very much falls into this space and is the really the first stage of creating more solid obligations on member states around what it's going to do in circular economy, philanthropy, entrepreneurship and the social economy more broadly. Um, so what do we consider social enterprise to be? It's wide and varied, to be frank, from what I've heard in terms of talking to the various interest groups so far. Um, it is around a market training, market trading entity, of course, uh, with social, environmental and some economic goals. It's around a reinvest, the reinvesting of profits back into the enterprise to deliver on those goals. And it is, of course, around a transparent and um, accountable governance structure. Again, in terms of the two pieces we have responsibility for across government, it's on the rural side and on the social enterprise side. So just to give you a flag of where we came from on the social enterprise side of our rural policy, we commissioned a piece of work before the, our rural future, the government's five-year plan for rural development was developed around the place of social enterprises in a rural economy. What came out of that was a number of actions within the, the strategy around public procurement uh, and around providing supports and so on for social enterprises in a rural setting. What also came out of that was a commitment to rural proof, any significant government policy that goes to government. And part of what we're doing here today, besides getting the ideas around your own suggestions on uh, rural interventions for social enterprises, is about that rural proofing piece. Whatever we come up with in an enterprise strategy, social enterprise strategy, has it been rural proof to understand how it impacts positively and negatively uh, social enterprises locally and how do we adapt to accommodate both the opportunities and the challenges. On the social enterprise strategy uh, piece, Minister's intention is to have a new social enterprise strategy by year end. This is very much feeding into that. It's towards the latter stages of the kind of stakeholder consultation. We've had six or seven town halls. We had an event last year, a national conference where people were invited to contribute to the policy. We've got a lot of the likes of pre-budget submissions and policy papers and done a huge amount of bilaterals with individual government departments and agencies. A lot more of that to do over the next month or so, but we're getting to that stage around the, the bottoming out on, on, on a public consultation process. So in terms of the new strategy, what we have here today to contribute to that is uh, advocate groups, uh, social enterprise representative bodies, uh, the likes of leaders, LDCs, county councils, 
government departments and academia. And what we'll do is, for anyone who has a thought, suggestion and so on, we will circulate an email that you can contribute to after today if it occurs to you later or if you feel you haven't had a chance to, to voice it as much as you would like. So we mentioned what's informing us in terms of the development of that policy for the end of the year, the OECD review, uh, which is really at the final stages and should be published probably uh, somewhere around October, the baseline study uh, that that uh, we've referred to and, and worked on with Siri and a number of others. And actually, I see Helen Johnson, I think, in the back of the room. Helen, you weren't mentioned so far, but the NESC review of social enterprise policy, I haven't met Helen face to face, but I can tell you I've been doing some digital spying on you. <laughs> and uh, I'm on my fourth read now of the, the, the NESC paper, which is an excellent one around the issues facing social enterprises. So that very much is also uh, informing our thoughts. So I'll close out really, um, maybe just signaling in terms of what's in the strategy or likely to be in the strategy. I think it's fair to say we've only had one. It's only a few years in and the same challenges still face the sector in terms of um, um, uh, uh, generating a, a real and true kind of identity for what is a really diverse sector, uh, helping social enterprises grow, supporting the kind of governance structures and the intelligence and so on of social enterprises, but also around now digitalization, mm -hmm. access to funding, and I could go on and on and on, and you know better than I do, to be frank, but we're trying to gather that now to develop across government particular responses that will help social enterprises into the coming years. So um, really look forward to hearing everything that's said today. Really look forward to hearing from the panel and yourselves and then to the session at the end, which is, um, which is really about trying to identify a few kind of key questions we've identified that we want to gather more coherent responses to. I'll leave it at that. As I say, we're here for chats and conversations if you want to have words with us at any, any time during the day. Uh, appreciate you all for coming and appreciate any contributions we get at all. Thanks a lot. Great, so just get ourselves ready for the next part and stop sharing there. Okay, so everyone online, you should be able to see us on stage. So I'm just gonna take us into the, the next session of the forum. Thanks so much, Rob, for just really uh, setting the scene for us. Uh, it's absolutely essential as we come into this forum today. Oh, um, You can see us moving. Yes, great. Um, okay, so we're going to move on from having set the scene. Uh, I'll use a mic, Phil. From having set the scene to our first panel discussion of uh, this morning. And what I'd like to do is I'm actually going to, I'll just uh, briefly introduce each uh, panel member in turn. And if you could come up when I introduce you, and then we'll move into the conversation. So I will position myself over here with my equipment. Okay, so um, yeah, so it's great and it's been great to meet colleagues. Uh, we, we had a little um, initial discussion around this today, what we were gonna be sharing and now to finally meet in person this morning has been wonderful. So our panel members for our first panel on the future of social enterprise, First of all, I am delighted to introduce Susie Khan. Uh, Susie uh, runs a social enterprise called Carrig Dulra. And I know, in fact, Susie, you just do so many things that I know you're going to say a little bit more about it. But let's just read out a few. A garden and permaculture design business, the director of the Carrig Dulra teaching farm, uh, a mother, a permaculture designer, an artist, an art therapist, um, evolving into an eco psychologist. I could go on and on. And um, Susie, it's been fantastic. We already had a little check in this morning and because you're a very interesting woman leader in everything that you do all you've created so uh Susie Khan wonderful take a seat okay next in our illustrious panel um uh, I'm delighted to introduce Chris Gordon. So Chris is the CEO of the Irish Social Enterprise Network. I know a long-standing organization in this country, as uh, you were telling me this morning. Um, and again, someone with many, many uh, strings to their bow, also the managing partner of Collaboration Ireland and an adjunct teaching fellow um, at Trinity Business School. And yeah, I know you're also the chair, voluntary chair of the Far and Wide Social Enterprise, uh, which if anyone doesn't know, I was looking up at it, it looks absolutely amazing. Uh, very interested in that. Um, and there's many other things that you do as well. So Chris, yeah, do come up and we'll hear more from you now.
Right. Oh yeah, but the tab it's the tablets or the, the cards, either way, low fi or high fi. Um okay, so the final member of our panel this morning. Um is Patrick Mulvihill, and um, Patrick is the founder of Amicitia, um, which is an incredible organization in Athen Rye, again, one that I've been starting to learn about through having um, met you, um, Patrick. Um, so I'd say it says your projects are, they're collaborative, they're intense, intentional and with a real appreciation of the troubled times that we're in and I think my sense was that you're looking at you know the times that we're in and saying we can address this at the very local level in fact that's almost the only place uh, to start um, and I know that it's a real a kind of diverse collective of like artists designers environmentalists um, social activists and so on it's really bringing together that diverse rich set of expertise so um, yeah Patrick look forward to hearing more about that Patrick Melville Hill. Okay, so here we are. Welcome. Hopefully everyone can see and uh, yes, uh, in the room we can all see as well. So this panel is really, and I'm going to keep my eye on the time as well. Yeah, okay. Um, so we've, we've said in this panel, we're really looking at the future of social enterprise, but I feel very honored to be uh, next to some people that are already you know, have created incredible social enterprises that already exist. There's already a past with a lot of rich learning in the work that each of you have done. And so, and that is going to feed into the further future, all uh, further projects we might all create. And that's really why we'd love to, to hear from you today. So maybe as a kind of an opening, it'd be great to just hear from each of you, just maybe touch on, in your words, your your social enterprise, like what is it? Why is it um, that would that would also help us gather some learnings on what could be seeds for for future social enterprises? And I will produce my second mic. Yeah, here you are. We'll start with you, Susie. Um, hello, thank you, thanks, Ali. Um, I I want to sort of start by saying that any social entrepreneurs or social enterprises in the audience that feel that they've innovated from the margins or the edges, which are very fertile places, um, but often take a long time before it comes towards, um, you know, a more mainstream or center. And so i am uh, been involved in social enterprise for more than nearly 20 years. And at the beginning of that, it was a very marginal thing to be involved in and very um, un, like unfamiliar. And then Karakdura itself um, was kind of a, a baby version of what you have become, um, which was to look at whole systems design and regenerative design um, and rather alternatives to extractive um, economies out of communities and more into creating spirals of abundance, not spirals of erosion. Um, and so we set up as an education um, social enterprise focus, um, but we wanted to be place based and land based and location based um, so as that we could, you know, walk our talk from the very beginning and show people what that looked like, even if the concepts sound confusing. And the reason I think they often sound confusing is we're, we're very used to siloed funds to fragmented economies and fragmented activity. And so when we talk about whole system design or regenerative design and people say, so you, you do gardening. And I say, well, I do gardening, do revolution, you know, do art, do, you know, so it's that bit is like trying to box it. And I think increasingly we're understanding that the system change and the demands that we have to um, face require whole system change. They, they can't work in silos. And I suppose we were early adopters of that, early adopters of social enterprise. And it was, you know, why social enterprise at the beginning and, and also being place-based and rural was that we'd been involved, myself and my husband had been involved in the startup of a traveler social enterprise, a work integration social enterprise that's over 20 years now called Shuttleknit. I'm actually roped back in to be on the board of Shuttleknit again at the moment. You never get away from something you be, you're involved with. And so I'd heard this uh, term social enterprise very early on. And I actually spent a lot of years in the early years, like I started in 2007, they started in the late 90s, um, saying, no, we're not a work integration social enterprise, because a lot of people said you're not a social enterprise if you're not employing marginal um, uh, groups. And that was the concept of it back in the early 2000s. So we were saying, well, actually, we're working with the whole community. So we, we do integrate and bring our participants and our learners and our outreach is all in, in everybody in the community, including marginalized groups, but we weren't a wise uh, an employer. And I think one other thing about the social enterprise definitions, which we all talk about a lot, um, 
is that when something's emergent, you have multiple definitions because it's a dynamic emerging field. And so you can, and obviously for government policy, it makes sense to try to condense that into a simplified, but the, that will never represent the sector at, when it's at this emergent dynamic stage, you know, because it's always going to have different things. So for example, our, uh, you know, the legal forum issue, the, all these other things that I'm sure will come up and regularly come up. We rang a law professor in um, UCD and said, what legal form should we're going to start this thing and watch, you know, and is there a thing called not for profit in Ireland? And he said, no, actually, you know, my husband's from the States. And he said, you can call yourself a not for profit because nobody else will know what that is. And you can, it's not illegal, you know? And so we've created our own hybrid set ourselves up as a limited company by liability and behaved like a charity and published our accounts and said we were not for profit and um, reinvested. Well, we haven't had any profits. We reinvest everything we do back into the social enterprise. We kind of decided to raise it like a fifth child. I have four kids. And so we said, this one will have to wash its face, but we're actually not going to take income for it. You know, so bit by bit, it can, all the programs could self-fund, you know, we could, but it meant a lot of flexibility in that emergent space. So we could get support from our local leader company. We could get support from our, our Leo office because we were a business and they understood us to be a business. We rarely could get charity support, but we kind of didn't want a, a, a siloed funding because, you know, we get little pockets, but actually fundings that are trying to make something happen you know, don't always allow you to be entrepreneurial and adaptive to changing situations. So at the beginning of Carrick Dulra, we ran courses that we haven't matched the price of since because it was the boom. So we had Eddie Hobbs on a course. We had the owner of Boomers on a course. They're coming down to find out about regenerative system design as a kind of hobby. Um, and then, a, you know, a year later, the boom bust cycle had happened and we had unemployed builders and unemployed architects and landscape architects. So, you know, that wouldn't have fitted a particular grant aid cycle, you know, because um, they don't they don't match the speed of change generally. So that's maybe give you a flavor. <laughs> wow. Uh, thanks, Susie. I think that it gives us a flavor of how complex, in a sense, the whole ecosystem is. And I was really struck by your first point is just even, you know, I was never really educated in that whole system view in my own education and grasping it, trying to quickly develop my awareness now is, is it's a work. And I, in a way, I actually look to nature is, 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 and it's interesting that that's actually one of the foundations of your own enterprise. Um, so, so there's that part, our own awareness at this stage in our societal development. Then you were saying also a social enterprise doesn't have to just be one way. It doesn't have to just be the wise model. And then with the emergence, actually it can have many forms, maybe all at once. So, wow, a lot there. Let's, let's continue that, the sort of story. So how about if we move on to you, Chris, in the same way what could you tell us about either the organization organization you're connected to now or even another one that brings out some of what a social enterprise is in your experience and just just to say I, I never try and put Susie into any type of box for any of these things I'm glad also Susie doesn't do that as well which is great uh, it's it's a useful uh, term to be able to think about things wider than just one thing um yeah, the sense of identity is quite a problem and I think it always has been I think for the last number of years social enterprises as old as the hills. But um, people didn't really understand what it meant. In Ireland, we really kind of had, we had a lot of cooperatives. And we've got this great tradition, particularly in rural society, of communities coming together in whatever legal form to be able to do these things. But it, it kind of got lost a little bit when we kind of went more private. And social enterprise really is, is kind of, it's stuck in the, in the craw of people because there was charities and we understood that. We understood the idea of setting something up for an impact and maybe getting generating income from revenue from um, the government or grant aid or something like that. And then we had private companies and we all understood that. We all understood selling products and services and getting the profit back and being able to reinvest them. But we didn't understand what is it about selling products and services and using that money to make an impact in the world. And I think we didn't really get that until I suppose the, the, the 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 terminology, which is still vague for an awful lot of people, you know, clearly not inside this room, but obviously still people don't quite understand and they all have their own version of it. So the Irish Social Enterprise Network was set up a good number of years ago with help and support and following from great people that made things happen to currently now. Um, 
try to be able to point people in the right direction for the supports they need to get their ideas off the ground or their organization to the next level. Um, advocacy education network, trying to make sure that people are, are better off. And, you know, we, we try our best on that. We run the Buy Social Initiative here in Ireland since 2016, and we try and make sure that people have an outlet because we believe that social enterprise is, is a huge thing. Um, I'm, an, I'm very rarely involved in social enterprise boards. That's actually changed just recently uh, with another one, but I am on the board of a social enterprise in Northern Ireland called Far and Wild. And I just have to do a shout out because yesterday we got um, Far and Wild uh, works out outdoor education, working with kids at risk. We do accessibility, outdoor mountain biking and activities. Uh, so people in wheelchair or whatever, this is 15 years ago, um, we, we set this initiative up. We do an awful lot of startup paddle boards and all that sort of stuff. Um, and only yesterday we got a word that National Geographic has featured Far and Wild as a social enterprise. This is the sort of thing that we should be doing. Um, and I'm delighted for the, for the, for the small team that, that are a part of that, that made that happen. And it's all set up as a community interest company, a social enterprise. How do we make life better for the people in the surrounding uh, uh communities uh, and it's a phenomenal success story so we're delighted to be involved in that but uh, yeah that's where we're involved with. I may pass over to this guy yeah pass over so yeah we'll continue the story that's yeah I, I knew Farm Wild was something very special so it's great to hear that it's light is shining brighter and brighter so yeah Patrick last but not least I'm dying to hear more about the amazing Amicitia yeah. thanks uh, yeah so similar enough to Susie actually we started myself and my father started the business um so we started as a technology company supporting people with people with disabilities and older people um, and quickly realized that technology wasn't you know the solution to everything and we need to go broader and get deeper into communities so we opened a social hub in Nathan Ryan we essentially just invited the community in to us and give them space and they, that's where an emergence comes into it allowing space for ideas and people to come together and it's grown from there really into doing sustainability projects. Um, we do uh, recently got a, a small two acre site for biodiversity projects. We do education programs. We worked with 60 social enterprises across the country last year to mentoring and training. And then we have a socially engaged art practice as well, which kind of supports that idea of communicating these complex topics into something that's digestible and understandable for groups to, to really get their heads around and also want to become part of. So that's really our story. So. Wonderful. Thanks, Patrick. I wonder if we could just stay with you for a moment, Patrick, because in a way, as I said, with the, the Rural Ideas Forum altogether, we're we're sort of looking at two things. One is the challenges, the challenges that we are facing in our society right now, the challenges that we might be facing in trying to develop these kinds of initiatives, and also the real opportunities. And I think of any initiative, so social enterprises are clearly those that could really address some of the most pressing challenges of our times. And I wonder maybe if we start with you, Patrick, just, um, I mean, there's also, there's so many, I mean, it's, it's almost overwhelming. That's what I loved about your project is you're really like, no, we're going to, we're going to start with right with our own town. But if you were to bring to mind, like, what, what would you say is a particular challenge that you have perceived and know is there in your local society that your own enterprise is addressing? Like, even if there's a story to tell, so, or you could be more than one, but even if you pick one community, uh, an example of how Amitsitia has helped with that. I, I think the main thing for us, and it's right across the sector, is just that siloed mentality around funding and the way that funding is driven towards people working individually and to compete against each other. But we try to work in a multidisciplinary way. So like we've raised our revenues quite significantly over the last number of years by working in partnership with others. We're still a very small, small organization, but just by working together with other groups, it unlocks a lot more funding as more social procurement comes into play, as more um, policy directed down from the EU comes into play. Social enterprises really, really have a huge opportunity to be the leaders in the new economy because every business should essentially be social. So, it's just Okay, so are you saying that one of the key things is 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 this without the social enterprise, the, the, the siloed funding means that nothing really gets addressed in a kind of a connected way, is that? It doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, we get funding in the door and that helps people to keep going, but it, it, it kind of traps you into that box that you can't think beyond that because the funding is only directing you in one way. So how do we work in partnership to, to innovate around that as well? We can use those funds that exist there to go into partnership together. It's not just about the, the funding needs to change, but it's the mentality of us working collectively. And that's, that's a national pro problem. It's not necessarily any one individual's fault or any one group's fault. Okay, so that and that seems to connect to really what Susie was opening with as well. Just maybe just getting very sort of 
like on the ground in terms of your own community colleagues, is there a particular, I don't know, it's hard to group people, but group of people in, in Atenrai that have particularly been supported by the work of Amicitia? Yeah, so I mean, we work with a lot of, so part of the technology projects we do, for example, will be with uh, disability groups and then the social hub, because we're building connections with different sectors and different groups, we naturally can bring those groups together to, to activate projects locally. So the, the garden that I just mentioned, that's become a nice space for people to communicate uh, around how can we collectively work together. So there's the women's shed there, there's the Ukrainian group and there's disability groups all coming together around one project to see how they can collectively enact change in their area. Gosh, you really, I'm, I'm, I'm getting it. Sorry, I'm really slow. I'm afraid I'm not a, an expert in social enterprise. I sort of wish I were and I'm very attracted to them. But I realise I'm almost going down that that uh, narrow mentality myself, like, oh, which group are you really helping? And it's like, no, the whole point is it needs a connected approach and this is the way to do it. And this isn't what has been happening up until now. So it's very exciting and uh, I hope uh, I'm catching up with you. With also I know that your work might be so the opening kind of is particular communities but also you may as well in the way that Patrick did um, yes and I think um, to say the piece about uh, nature-based understanding um, as a framework which is what permaculture essentially is is an interconnected interdisciplinary um, design system in order that you do connect all these parts you know if you want to have a community garden if you want to have uh, an energy cooperative you know it, like those silos I suppose don't appear at first to be connected but it, everything's connected you know and so when you understand that and, and ecosystems are a way to understand that so that's a framework that we can use but I think that you mentioned facing the issues of our time we're in what people are starting to summarize as the poly crisis because we can't name all the crises at once we can't just say you know we've got an inequality pride crisis a growing inequity we've got a you know um a biodiversity crisis a climate crisis and and you know you just kind of keep going so because they are systemic issues, you can't address them in silos, you know. And so I think that, uh, and I'm very, you know, I would very much agree that where we can address them is in the local and there is a shift. And I think the rural proofing and the rural policy piece um, is to bring all the resources to bear in the rural areas where you have local knowledge, where you have local knowledge of assets, where you have local knowledge of, you know, of, of specificity of place. Um, one of the things I'm involved with in Caragdura now is a public funded climate action learning piece around place-based centers of excellence for climate adaptation and learning. And we're trying to create some frameworks to support because we know there are others out there who could step in, you know, with the right supports and so on. Um, but I think that that has to, we have to be really aware that there's an increased demand and ask of rural communities, of local development, you know, agencies, of councils to respond to the poly crisis, like all of the new climate action strategies being, you know, rolled out very fast, you know, in local councils by newly hired staff, you know, to get those plans together. It's huge demand. And if we don't have the response of how we enable cooperative, you know, nature again, how we enable um, social enterprise, we really actually won't meet the crisis. You know, the systemic, it's a bit like that idea that's repeated often, but the solutions can't be made by the minds that made them. And sometimes people think that means different people's minds, you know, which it sometimes does. Let's hear from voices on the margins we don't hear from. Let's increase the voices you know, of 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 many people that aren't heard from, but it also does mean, you know, working with a different understanding, which is kind of what happened when you expanded and said, oh, we could actually work with everybody. And I, maybe I joke sometimes that, you know, I have a different mind. I have very dyslexic, probably not very neurotypical mind. And for a long time, that was a disadvantage. Turns out my time has come. I actually can't keep up with the requests around, could we look at this in a whole systems way? You know, could we could from, you know, Carrick Dool was doing work. I'm working with the wheel on a cross island project and a just transition project in the Midlands that is, you know, where I get my salary to not have to extract any salary out of Carrick Dool. Um, But it is a moment where different minds can be 
you know, super strengths instead of super weaknesses. Um, if you happen to be at it as long as I have and get the opportunities, I, you know, there's a lot of privilege now in my life to get these kind of opportunities. This is one of the first opportunities to be on a panel and speak about this, even though there'd be a fair number of people in the room who know who I am. But, it, you know, it is that bit of bringing another voice to the table, I guess, and doing that all the time and then bringing the support to the communities that are like in the in the project in the Midlands, so speaking with 20 communities recently, the ideas are huge. The Just Transition Committee said, the ideas out of Ireland are amazing, but we've got an implementation gap. We've got a capacity gap. You've got a support gap. You know, we want to see these ideas come to life, but there is, you know, demands on the leader companies in this, you know, can you all do all that? But is there enough support for you to do all that? So there's a really big moment and big opportunity and a big kind of risk factor if we don't take the opportunity. Wonderful. Wow. Thanks, Susie. And just, I feel like we're creating a, we're sort of painting a picture. You know, there's a sense of we need to be looking at this in the connected way, in the whole systems way. And then also earlier on in that, this last statement, you were also saying about, yeah, there needs support, but the resources right, need to be right there in the rural area, in that local rural area. That's probably the only way it's going to work. Yeah. And maybe just to touch. John, the, the exit talk a lot about the drain of people out of rural communities. Well, those people are a lot of the young people going to go to colleges, you know, and maybe they go and travel. Um, what will call them back will be these exciting opportunities to contribute. And that's already happening. And I think that that has to happen, you know, in because there's a, a burnout of older voluntary contributors, you know, especially after COVID, where the communities held us and so many people gave their all. And, if, you know, so I think that opportunity of excitement to say, come back into your community and bring with you that expertise, bring with you as well. And I think, you know, that if you're giving supports at a hyper local level, panels of experts in business development, you know, interagency connected hubs for impact measurement, like take the burdens away and, and let everybody flourish. And, you, you know, I think we won't, we couldn't believe what could happen. Wonderful. Well, let's just um, move on to Chris with that same question. So it was the, the starting was about, well, which particular challenges now? It's actually, it's the poly crisis set of challenges. It's the way of working in social enterprises. Anything more from you on that of like... Um... <laughs> Anything more than the world is burning, we need help and support. Yeah, just to expand on that. Um, yeah, there's very specific challenges that I think could be met within the area. And I know they're definitely being touched upon uh, an awful lot about the difference between rural and urban is about the sense of community. You know, there's a there is a difference between rural and social enterprises and urban transport or disbursement or the, the the kind of the very specific issues that might happen on an island are totally different to the Midlands or totally different to Dublin city centre. And so um, it is quite interesting to think that there's an opportunity to be done when people are going back. Um, COVID, I don't want to say. COVID has been awful for everybody. It's there's a horrible thing, but there's been huge advantages, I think, from COVID being able to um, uh, impact people's lives where they've gone back and gone remotely. Huge groundswell of support, incredible expertise in this room. If we just, we didn't have enough time, but like if we just took the microphone for everybody in this room, the amount of expertise, knowledge gained from that experience alone has been extraordinary. And I, and I, and I do think when social enterprise hits a crisis when private enterprises were hit with the crisis of COVID, they closed their doors and they shut down, and that was the right thing to do. But social enterprises, I always say, they shut the front door and they open the back door. They set up the meals on wheels. They were there to respond. In two thousand and nine, social enterprises were there to help with uh, unemployment. Um, they were there to help people who are socially excluded or marginalised who wouldn't have a job normally or might not be able to be help integrate. We've got the Ukraine refugee, which is a crisis currently been dealt with mostly by communities in their area and deftly and hopefully there's an opportunity for us to be able to showcase those great things that happen when 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 Irish communities hit hit these roadblocks but there will be more crises like I don't know what it is and I hope there isn't one but there will be more like as I said the world is burning we've got a challenge here so social enterprise can offer an opportunity one of them I think is energy co-ops it's just an extraordinary thing if we are able to get co-op legislation up to speed, it'll be an awful lot easier to be able to implement solar panel, wind farm, uh, hydro, electricities, all being generated locality, uh, locally and owned by the community and has a very limited opportunity to be sold off to the highest bidder. So now we're generating electricity for some offshore uh, things. So there's a huge opportunity in certain areas that can make a difference and could offer an opportunity for people. Um, just a couple of things as well, like social enterprise 
has an extraordinary ability to to generate income and opportunity in the areas. Um, and, and one of the massive aspects, I think what we should be open for here is social enterprise by default. Certainly in the Irish Social Enterprise Network, we want to see that I am able to get my energy from a social enterprise. I'm able to shop in a grocery from a social enterprise. I'm able to um, have my insurance from a social enterprise as a mutual. That opportunity is available to Ireland. And, you know, we can all think of the opportunity that's been afforded by credit unions. And what if credit unions are become the mainstay? Of, of banking in, in Ireland. You know, the, the difference that that could make by having it solely owned in the communities that it supports, uh, it's just an extraordinary opportunity. Because, um, but yeah, I fully agree. There's opportunities that are there and we want to grasp them. We do have difficulty in being able to grasp them. Um, just one final thing. We work with a Just Transition project. I need to give a shout out to my, my people in Social Enterprise Exchange who are uh, Gab and Cloda and, and Ashley that are working in uh, Midlands area. Um, to try and figure out what are the barriers and opportunities for social enterprises. A couple of things that we've done in a recent study that's coming out is that policy, the most boring thing in the English language possibly, but partly why we're here, informs all of the funding and finance and all of the other supports that come down. And so we need to get involved in our local economic community plan, our local economic development plan. And people don't understand the role that that plays. And so once we can harmonize even the interaction of those things, I'm even talking about local economic development plan. I don't even know if people are like, what? I remember that from my civics class. What is that? But these are crucial because that highlights and implements um, an obligation on local authorities to make a difference. The Council of Europe have a huge um, uh, social economy action plan uh, recommendations that could be easily copied and pasted and transposed into these uh, local economic or development or community plans that can be quite transformative. And it could take a year or two, but it allows the funding and finance and it, it unblocks a lot of the, the challenges. So there's huge opportunity even just in those things. Um, and so we're bringing over some of our uh, elected representatives, uh, representatives and knowledgeable representatives of those communities to another place in Europe on an exchange in November to um, look at how other communities like that have made a difference. And so, you know, lean on the stuff that's already there. Local and European are crucial for us and we need to be, we need to do better. Uh, we, we can do better and we should do better. Thank you, Chris. Um, so we are we are coming towards the end of just hearing the initial statements. I feel um, in a way you moved into like that's as we said we've got these two parts the challenges but into opportunity. And I wonder if I could then maybe just ask Patrick and Susie. We haven't got a lot of time because it also as you say we have incredible wisdom in the room. We'd love a moment for a bit of exchange together. But maybe just a final short statement from each of Patrick and Susie into this area that Chris has taken us into of just you know the real opportunities or even had to name one of them. It's maybe not only one. And this is with a view of we're framing the new social enterprise policy, which we have many uh, esteemed policymakers in the room. So yes, we're, we're, it's not a dirty word in this room and it's, it's very important. So this will kind of um, feed into that. So yeah, Patrick, uh, an opportunity that you see going forward. I think there's huge opportunities in the procurement sector. I mean, we, there is some work going on looking at better social procurement and clauses within procurement because there's you know, there's the link between public and the, the third sector there that that's untapped at the moment. And if you put in the proper clauses, we can get some some quick wins for the sector and, and bring a lot of new revenue in to support marginalized groups and others as well. Wonderful. Great procurement. Absolutely essential. And maybe a final word from Susie. Oh, and, and uh, yeah. um, I suppose the the you know, when I think about it in the policy context, I'm I'm thinking about all the the gap filling that social enterprise do, does, that's part of what our kind of is like, where is the gap? But I also see that if you were to draw some circles of the sphere of influence and power, you know, what, what Chris is talking about, the, 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 the amount of energy that goes in, energy and resource and money that goes into the big corporate, you know, world, the big multinational world in Ireland. And I think you have to say, if is part of the rural proofing, the social enterprise appraisal, you know, proofing of, of grants, the, the shared island proofing of all of this, it, you know, is it supporting something that's extractive from rural communities? You know, um, because that it, so there's kind of the role of government is to regulate that big business world. And I think it also has to starve and stop it from extractive economies out of rural Ireland that we can see have had negative downstream effects. 
at the same time as build up and support this much smaller community sector. You know, when you have three circles, business is the biggest one, government is the next size down and community is the smallest. And so if we don't redress that kind of Venn diagram where we have overlapping spheres of activity, but community is, you know, community social enterprise bases like cooperatives are supported. So I think it's kind of the proofing bit that people are thinking about is, you know, if we have a minister for social economy in Northern Ireland, have mental health chariot, you know, champions, we have a champion for social enterprise. We regularly, we have sustainable development champions. You know, it, it's kind of like addressing that imbalance of attention, power, and kind of what we, you know, I would negatively call corporate capture of our young people or the resources or all the experts who are helping and the universities who are helping them build up big business. But is it extractive or is it abundant building or generative in our rural areas? And I honestly think that there's something about policy that I totally get has to be based on data like the new baseline study. But it can also go and look at Scotland or Northern Ireland jurisdictions really near us or developing you know economies in the global south and say well actually we can see it's working there will we just pilot it as a small policy in Donegal or Kerry or Cork and say there's a lot of times leader companies do that and they say we just tried a new thing I just found out that the Cork leader who you're going to hear from later on has got ecologists I'm like you have ecologists in your in your in CCAT you know so like if you pilot things that are already working at the same time as gathering data on what's happening, I think that you'll get the results like we do as entrepreneurs, pivoting fast, failing quickly, you know, and turning it around. So that would be my context. Mm, thanks so much, Susie. Okay, final word from Chris. Final one. We just uh, this is an exclusive. We've um, we've just been able to get European fund and finance um, for two projects. One of them is by Wisely to be able to do the procurement pieces. Uh, Trick said, like it's absolutely the lowest hanging fruit. There's an opportunity there. You can purchase from anybody. Why not purchase from a social enterprise? It's it's the simplest ask to be able to support any social enterprise. And, and there are supports there um, by, by social.e so that there will be money to be able to help with that. And there's also some money that we're helping help green social enterprises who are at the forefront, but now have fallen behind perhaps. And now social enterprises could access some of the money, maybe a quarter of a million or so, not up to like a little bit 10 grand bits to be able to inform them on how to be able to be better at greening their social enterprise. We need to do better. Um, we can do better. Um, we're dealing with these crises and I've no, I've, I've no doubt that the answer and solution to all of this will be social enterprise. Wonderful. So thank you. This is, we're not bringing the panel to an end. We're now moving into, um, uh, being able to take a few questions and answers. And I'm sorry to people that are physically in the room because the, Questions have been, oh wait, okay, I need to get hold of them now. Where are they? Here we are. Um, have been flying in in the online room. So I'll maybe just read out one of those and then turn back to the to the physical room as well. Um, so let's have a little look. Um, oh yeah, some of these have been coming to me directly. Okay. Uh, okay, maybe that's just a reflection. Um, okay, so one from Veronica. Um, getting directors is a huge challenge for social enterprises. Have you any advice on how to get directors on board? Um, there is a sense of community, you know, in, in, in the enterprise, but but it's difficult to get the directors to actually hold that role. So any thoughts on that from our panel? Anyone in our panel? I'll say something really quick on that, that that's a whole of sector issue at the moment, you know, from whole of work, sector, you well, mean? working for working uh, from. Right. I'm working for for the wheel, which is the you know national association or the umbrella body for for many charity social enterprise, and the same in Northern Ireland. The the attraction and retention of directors, you know, we've got and recruitment of staff, even you know, it's it is a whole of sector. So it, again, you can think of individual solutions to that, and I could definitely you know suggest a few, which I'm sure you will have. But it is a bit of a systemic piece, mm -hmm. you know, if the rewards and the risks you know, are, 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 are not working out for people, then they step away. Mm. Mm. I think we can look at ways to share resources and knowledge as well, so that, you know, in small rural communities, we can get people with particular expertise working across organizations. I know that doesn't solve all the governance issues, but it does help with certain uh, skills and experience that certain groups would need, that it, it's not just looking for one person to, to assist with a, a challenge in an organization. You're looking across a, a wider uh, network of people. Yeah, great idea. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, there are uh, boardmatch.ie supported by the DRCD as well as a phenomenal resource. They do a, mat a matching thing, but then you still have to attract them. And I think it's about making sure that your governance is in order and that you respect the role of the board and that you set it up in a way and do your best to inform yourself on how would, how how does it look when a director comes to you? What are the things that you need them for? And what be, be clear in expectations um, because it is, as we say, a real trick and a problem in the sector because I think we've just gone through that whole kind of dip. People were happy to do it. Now they weren't necessarily happy to do it. I think it's starting to happen again. I think again, COVID has obviously helped because people realize it's important to support their communities, but make it attractive. Um, and that's by doing your homework, getting the legal stuff right, making sure you're up to speed as you possibly can, and then targeting the people that you need, not that you can get. Mm -hmm. So like target mm -hmm. people that you need. And one last thought on yeah. that is about, um, I think that there's uh, the just again with the Just Transition Commissioner talking about Ireland, it, there is a, a desire for some more consortium bidding for some of the major funds. So I think that some of the higher capacity organizations with longevity and boards, you know, could be adopting a smaller social enterprise, you know, mm. and putting together joint bidding. And I think that would be yeah. a way to help, you know, build just kind of what you're saying, but at a, yeah, a, mm. like a, a group basis. Absolutely. Just hang on to that for a moment. Thank you. Yeah, there's again, a real picture building there. So turning now to our physical room, we're really looking at this. What's the future of social enterprise? Hearing everything that we've heard, the challenges, opportunities. What are questions arising for you or remarks, things you might like to put to the panel or bring into the room? Seamus. Yeah, thanks, Seamus Bond, Irish Shore Link. We, an umbrella body, we have the Meals and Wheels Network, which is a major... I want to go back to the, the the basics of of social economy and social enterprise, profit and non-for-profit. And I think both, all of you touched on it. The bottom line is, if you're a Meals and Wheels group and you're setting up in rural Ireland, particularly in the isolated areas, there's no profit to be made. There's simply no profit to be made. And yet there's a service that needs to be done. There's no one else doing it. So groups do set up. But it comes to the stage where you have to ask yourself, how do we, in policy terms, and you mentioned this a lot in your, well, all three of you, how do we reconcile that policy deficit with the reality on the ground? I mean, all the other stuff is there, the, the capacity, getting people on boards, all of that, they're all challenges. But that's the bottom line. And I know, because I work a lot in Europe as well, they have a very different view and definition of social enterprise, which we might learn from as well. Thank you, Seamus. Yeah, so responses. I'll just quickly say a bit, and I'm sure Chris has more to say on this. As a board member of Shuttleknit, the Traveller Social Enterprise that does knitwear, which by the way, go and check them out and they've got amazing products. Um, but the that tension has been there in the 20 years since it's set up between you're doing a work integration social enterprise in a competitive area of fashion knitwear with a community who are already marginalized and experience multiple difficulties. And I think it's it's if that tension isn't brought up more about how viable is the business part, and yet at the same time, how vital is the social part, you know, that that tension has to be talked about more because I think it's it, the pressure on, you know, I know, for example, a. Uh, uh, wisest work integration social enterprise csp in cork that was working with people with disabilities and there would have been actually an increase in um activity that could have happened if the workforce could be put under pressure to generate more of the product but it's like you can't do that and not lose the social um benefit and so i think that tension has to be spoken a bit more about and unpacked a bit more in policy um, I think um, maybe Seamus has been a bit modest about he works in Europe. Uh, he leads one of the largest uh, groups in social economy in Europe. Um, the expertise in this room is is extraordinary. Um, yeah, I, I agree. And I don't think Meals and Wheels was out for anybody to make profits or anything else. I know there was an awful lot of private companies that were seeking to support Meals and Wheels that were generating here's 15 euro a meal when they could produce it for three so um but the social enterprises were the ones that were the basis for those meals on wheels so they used their profits that they got over the years the small media small monies that they'd got over the years and they used that to put it into it until they ran out of money i wonder and there's way more to do this but this is a policy issue because i don't think it was anybody's responsibility five six seven ten years ago to put in 
we must support if there is COVID and it hits Ireland for more than two years, we must give this pot of money. And one of the challenges was the HSC was screwed for money. The local authorities were screwed for money. They were all, and, and no one's responsibility was to give that money. And so we know that this is going to happen again. No, I hope it won't, but like we know a crisis is going to happen again. The policy issue needs to be flexible enough to be able to adapt and to be fair to civil servants or anybody in the, to allow them the flexibility to move those pots of money where the need arises, particularly in emergency situations within the year that can't be compensated throughout the year. So 100%, I know this is a challenge all across Europe as well, and you'd certainly be able to talk about it at length, but I do believe that the expertise needs to come from the local communities. They need to be given policy implications to be able to make the decisions that are necessary to make those things happen. I have one fear of social enterprises, which is that we've got full employment. We're doing all the things that we need to do. Burnout is huge in the sector. It's the one thing that I talk about. And now I feel like there's going to be some other thing. We go in cycles every seven years of like a crisis or a thing or whatever. Um, and the government are like, well, we've got full unemployment. We don't need to pay money to social enterprises. The, the need is gone. We've done this before. We starved social enterprises pre-2008, and then we try to pick those courses back up again, 2011, to try and employ people again. We need to avoid that. It's inevitable that something will happen. We need to have the policy implications now to set up ourselves right for the future. And what's the worst that can happen? Let's say social enterprises are supported now and no crisis comes. Aren't we still better off? Like, so social enterprise by default, we should need to be saying, how do we make sure that everybody setting up an enterprise knows how to set up a social enterprise by default? And we sure that we're purchasing from social enterprise back on our procurement piece. We need to do better on that. And we can do better and it's easy to do better. So that's our next step. Thank you, Chris. Patrick, can we add to that? Yeah. yeah could I just jump in real quick? There's a current oh, whole of government to talk about the, the well-being economy. So trying to move away from, yeah, the, it, valuing things based on economics and profit. So I think we as a sector can put more energy and pressure on government to adopt those policies and move towards that well-being economy. And I think would be a big step in the right direction then as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Patrick. Just hold on to that for a moment. So just um, coming to the end of the the, uh, the Q and A, but I'll maybe just going to make a couple of remarks and maybe we'll hear uh, I'll have a final question. Oh, and there's a, some responses here. Great answer, Patrick. Thank you. Um, just just following on, there was a, some extra conversation here around the director thing, but there's a point here around um, that actually the, the vision and objectives is really essential in terms of getting you know getting the right director and just for the social enterprise altogether. So there's a few people in the online room really resonating that. Um, and also there's been a couple of points here about just, you know, we haven't touched on this as much, but on the kind of environmental aspect you know, every community centre needs to, you know, have the sufficient solar capacity to cut electric bills. You know, climate adaptation and mitigation is a massive opportunity. So these are just points that are just to kind of include them in our in our reflections here today. Um, maybe just a final question from the um, in-person room. Yes. So it's Helen, is it? Yes. Yeah, so Helen, I'll bring you a microphone uh, somehow. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> excuse me, it's Helen Johnson from um, the National Economic and Social Council. Oh, okay. <laughs> Should I <pull> my hair? <laughs> um, oh, okay, uh, thank you. So thanks to the, the panelists for their contributions. Um, I just wanted to really follow on from Patrick's point um, about the importance of well-being, so on, we've mentioned rural proofing. But the other thing that, that sometimes talked about is social impact assessment. Um, and I think there's value in that because a lot of the supports and so on are financially driven, but I think the social impact assessment can balance that. Obviously there is a finance piece, um, but there's also a need for the social impact assessment. We can talk a lot more about that because sometimes it gets very technical, maybe too technical, but there certainly is a place I think for that. Maybe one final point is about community wealth building. And if we kind of introduce that alongside the, the social enterprises, quite often communities can provide facilities and so on, and they have ownership of those facilities and then social enterprises can work out of those spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. So maybe if there's anyone that has a, I mean, I think that's just a really two important points to be made um, for, for the whole conversation. Anything to add to that from either of you? Yeah. I, I think there's one challenge with the impact is just the, the complexity of it and for smaller organizations to ma manage and monitor their impact. So there is ways that we can look at collective impact, particularly in rural communities as well, and particularly at that town and place-based level. So I think it's, yeah, it's a good idea. 
Yeah, I, it's brilliant. I mean, the, the social impact measurement is about outcome instead of output. It's not like the number of bums on seats. It's about as a result of them being there, how has their life changed? And I think it's unfortunate that there might be an extra burden on social enterprise or community and voluntary sector organizations to be able to report on those things and particularly double report sometimes. And so it is quite tricky. There's a number of different elements that need to be brought in and sometimes to do a formal evaluation of outcome social impact measurement, you need an external, which again is an extra cost and time and effort. I think it's absolutely necessary. We want outcomes. I get all of that, but we need to be mindful that we don't put extra burdens on social enterprises who are already doing good work to make these things happen. So it's a point well made. Just the other thing is that Bring if we don't, European uh, mandates are coming now in for companies that are over 500 million or 250 million in revenue and 500 staff or whatever. They're starting to do social and environmental and governance impact measurement. And I have a fear that if social enterprise and social economy organizations, and it's it's wider than just social enterprise, social economy organizations don't get involved in that conversation, some of the larger multinationals are going to dictate what it means to be social or environmental. Now, we're in, we are ourselves and our partners are involved in some of those conversations, but it does need to be mindful that it's... If a large multinational says, and this is what it means to be social, and that's X number of um, people from diversity or backgrounds employed in a company at any one stage, that just becomes the law because no one else said that it couldn't be that. So I think it's mindful. We do have a role, and I don't want to think necessarily about Europe, but an awful lot happens with that to be able to impact us here in Ireland. So just keep that in mind too. Yeah. Um, I think that there are some countries in Europe that have in-house, in-government, in local and national government um, teams that are helping write the social, you know, do the social impact stuff. And I think that there's, I, I you know, I won't tell a tale out of school, school, but somebody who asked me to come and be on this panel, you know, talked when working in a, in a local agency about basically helping people write their own grants, helping people write their own, you know, at not part of the job, not supposed to do it. But there's a reason why that starts happening um, is because it's, it is beyond, you know, the individual social enterprises. And yet at the same time, government needs to counter a lot of things. We've got a central statistics office that is, you know, measuring. We're just reported in in July on our sustainable development goals, and we could be feeding in so much stuff to that, but not by ourselves as social enterprises with agency support or some, you know, like a house, if you like, that has here's our panel of experts, here's our other thing that's actually already funded. You just tap in. You know, we don't need to keep on going back for funding for and you never get longitudinal studies, by the way, on impact. So you're never going to see what Carrick Dulra's impact in 16 years in County Wicklow is. I can't, you know, I can't tell you, but people in Wicklow could tell you, you know, but it's not, um, you know, it's not so visible. So I think that's a challenge. Um, yeah. And the community wealth building, Helen, like I'd be a huge support of that becoming. And we were part of I was part of um project in Ardara and Donegal and, and Phibs were in Dublin called the People's Transition with Task, which I'm still advisor to. And that looked at, you know, having anchor institutions, which is a whole like getting a bit bigger than procurement and saying, what is participatory budgeting for the whole council? Where is the spend going? How could that spend be very you know, Argyle Council in Scotland has looked across its entire system to say, how could our spending be, you know, that generative type of spending, not that extractive where we're bringing in, you know, where the money's draining like a leaky bucket out of the local economy into other providers from, you know, anywhere else indeed. So I think community wealth building has a lot to offer the social enterprise space. Thank you. And thank you for that, that remark, Helen, and for these responses. And it feels like we kind of started with really looking at the, the whole system um, space in which social enterprises really operate and thrive. And I would come back around to the, to the essential element of enrichment funding, and that that also needs to be totally holistic and, and grounded in the community. And that's really a part of how, you know, how we need to build things going forward. So with that, we will end uh, this panel discussion. A really big thanks to Patrick Melville, Chris Gordon, and Susie Khan. Thank you. And yes, oh yes, 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 I see Gareth, I don't think he's waving at me, he's saying, saying exactly what I'm thinking, which it's a 10 minute break. So 10 minute break for those in the room, we have fresh coffee and so on at side. Uh, 10 minutes for those of you online to get what you wish and we'll see you back here 10 minutes time. Thanks everyone. So inviting everyone in the in-person room back into your seats after this break. Um, Hello again to our online colleagues.
and uh, yeah, it really is. Um, this is such a full day. It's very exciting, and it's hard to have all the conversations. I want to keep us on track with times, but I've been approached with interesting conversations myself. So um, yeah, it's a sign of a great event when there's more to do than you can possibly fit in. So yeah, just inviting the last people in the in-person room to take a seat uh, because we're only halfway through. We're moving into the second part of the main section of the forum. And I'll just check that, uh, yeah, we have people starting to gather. I'm having to work out how I juggle all my technology here, but I'm managing, I think I'm managing. Um, so we're moving into the second half of our, the main forum this morning. And as I said, after our lovely break, uh, being very well looked after in this beautiful hotel, um, we're also going to move into, first of all, a real um, a kind of presentation, a sharing of work and findings that have been done, um, which is on the baseline data gathering exercise that was a really essential part, as, um, was identified as something that was so needed um, for development of the social enterprise sector. So to do that, I'm going to uh, introduce an esteemed uh, colleague, which is John Logue, who is now the CEO of um, Social Enterprise Republic of Ireland. Um, and I know that's a recent appointment in the role but uh, so congratulations to John uh, congratulations for um, stepping into that role as CEO um, and before that you were head of operations at the Donegal local development company um, and I know that that all of that work has uh, been a part of uh, having a long-standing experience of advising social enterprises um, and I think this is also, you also have other roles like connected to the ILDN Social Enterprise Working Group. Um, you've uh, developed a social enterprise policy up in Donegal um, and also other things acted as a judge for the Social and Entrepreneurs Ireland Ideas Academy. Um, so with all of that great expertise, no better man to actually conduct this uh, study to draw out the key findings and to guide us on what we really need to know about that. So over to you, John Logue. <laughs> Afternoon, folks. I'll keep this very brief so we can get into the, uh, the panel discussion, probably more importantly, your own thoughts thereafter. Uh, I'll, I'll share 10 insights from the census data, but I suppose to begin with, why is it important that we have this data and all? And I think the, the answer to that is without good data, it's very hard to make good policy. And to give you an example of that, I want to bring you back very quickly to 1932 in Western Australia, where they had a problem with emus. Now, if anybody doesn't know what an emu is, it's a big flightless bird. It's kind of like a, a, a dodo or an ostrich. And the problem in Western Australia in 1932 is these, these dodos were eating all the crops, so they were destroying farmland. So the farmers contacted the government, and the government called in the military with machine guns to address, which was an, an emu overpopulation. Challenge being that the government and the military had bad data. In fact, they had no data. They didn't know anything about emus. They just thought these were big, docile, flightless creatures, flightless birds. And all you would have to do is drive up alongside them with the truck and the machine gun, and you'd have the job done in a matter of three or four days. Three and a half weeks later into this campaign, and no emus had been eradicated, the, the field general reported back to Central Command saying, these emus are so intelligent in their ability to evade and outmaneuver us, that whenever they eat now, they eat in small clusters. And one of the emus stands six feet tall while the rest of them eat, and he surveys for military trucks. And if our military trucks come within any shooting distance of them, he warns the rest of the emus and they all scatter. This was became known as the Great Emu War in Australia, a war that the Australian military lost. The emu population did not in any way dwindle. And there's a running joke in Australia today, why did the military lose the war to the emus? Because their data was for the birds. So thankfully in an Irish context, in a social enterprise context today, our data isn't for the birds. And for the first time really, we have a robust, if I can get the clicker working. There we go. Uh, okay. Would you mind doing it that way? Uh, that's all right. Yeah. The first time we have, a foundation data source based on a very robust methodology. So I'm going to take you through very quickly 10 insights from the baseline data. The first is what do social enterprises tend to do? And social enterprises in Ireland tend to be focused in one of five subsectors. So you'll see here 75% of social enterprises in Irish context operate in the childcare, community infrastructure, 
health, heritage, and sports spaces. But interestingly, over three quarters of social enterprises that responded to the survey or the census data uh, re reported that they operate in more than one economic activity. So it shows you in order to achieve their social purpose, they're having to branch out beyond one economic activity. Social enterprises in an Irish context tend to be companies limited by guarantee, and they tend to be registered charities. Now, that probably won't surprise anybody in this room, but when we've asked people over the last couple of weeks following the, the reporting of the baseline data, why are you a company limited by guarantee? Why are you a registered char charity? The response has actually been quite interesting. That's what we were told to do to get funding. It wasn't that it was responding to a particular business need. So maybe that's an interesting conversation to the panel have. Are there, are there ways that we can encourage social enterprises to explore other methods of legal status to achieve their aims? Social enterprises are a key enabler of labor market activation for programs for the government, but also equally labor market activation programs are really important to enable social enterprises to run their businesses. What are we talking about here? Community employment schemes, rural social scheme, the CSP, uh, TUS, et cetera. And 60% of social enterprises who are, have paid staff in an Irish context use labor market activation programs. In rural Ireland, that increases to 65%. And you'll see a real dependence, a real importance of labor market activation, particularly in community infrastructure. So if you think of your local rural community center, 90 plus percent of those organizations use labor market activation programs. One of the things we've seen from the data is the maturity of the sector. Social enterprises have long roots in their local community. So 48% of them have been operating for 20 plus years in their community. But interestingly, 16% of those that responded to the, the baseline data collection exercise are, are set up in the last four years. And one third of those were created for an environmental purpose in mind. So you'll see here, social enterprises, particularly new social enterprises, are responding to the green agenda. And interestingly, of the new social enterprises that have been created in the last four years, many of those are, are opting not to go for the CLG or the registered charity route. They're opting more and more for other forms of legal status. They tend to be micro enterprises. 57% of, of social enterprises classified themselves as having between one to nine people. Again, that's not something to be very surprising in, in this room. There are 84,000 people employed in the sector. So when you think about the social, social enterprise sector in an Irish context, it's not far off primary agriculture in terms of the number of employees that are in it. But we see a particular, um, I suppose, concentration of those staff in three subsectors, health, childcare, and training and worker integration, where they make up 51% of social enterprises, but they're about 70% of the total workforce in the, in the, um, in the sector. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, there's almost as many volunteers in the social enterprise sector as there are uh, workers. And we know we know how we, like Susie talked about it and Chris talked about it and Patrick talked about it earlier. Volunteers are vital for, for the social enterprise that we work with. But as we've seen post COVID, many people struggle to get voluntary board members in particular back into those organizations. This is no surprise, but it's very important to call this out. The social enterprise sector is driven by women. 69% of people in the sector are women. And in that, there's particular prevalence in the childcare sector where that rises to 90%, and in the health and social care space where that rises to 73%. I suppose two worrying stats, particularly from a rural Ireland context, 40% 40, 40 of social enterprises surveyed have an annual income of less than 100,000 euros a year, and 75% of those have an annual income of less than 50,000 euros a year. And again, what we see is a disparity between an urban and a rural social enterprise. So the median income for a rural social enterprise is around 80,000. The median income for an urban social enterprise is just over 250,000. So we're seeing disparities there that we really should talk about in the panel discussion. And then finally, lo local focus. Social enterprises tend to have a local focus, but this is more the case in rural areas. So 75% of social enterprises surveyed focus on their local areas, but in a rural context, that increases to 84%. So again, we're seeing a, a concentration of efforts in, in the rural area on supporting or providing a social impact in their local communities. And I will stop there so we can get into the panel discussion. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks so much, John. Yeah, do you want to take a seat there? I'm just going to uh, pause our sharing here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for really setting the scene. We've got a whole lot of numbers there and just kind of noting that 
without that work, those numbers simply didn't exist. And uh, you know, how could we really set strategy, create policy without that? So it's, uh, it's something significant. So um, yeah, it's nice to have the space to kind of get the numbers, but then actually to be able to discuss. So uh, joining John uh, and me on this panel, I'd like to introduce our two other panelists and, and get to uh, uh, meet them and join in this conversation here. So first of all, Helen, Helen, are you, is that you at the back? Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to meet you earlier. So I'm looking forward to meeting the amazing Helen Nolan, um, who is the founder of Shri Aga Sport, or you might be able to tell me better uh, how to pronounce that and talk about it. Um, but this is, if you don't know already, and uh, yeah, do come and take a seat, Helen, an incredible social enterprise up in Cardona in Ashowen. Um, and it, to me, it seems to combine a, an amazing number of your strengths as I, I read about you. Um, but uh, the organization provides services and activities for families, for children, for young people, adults. It's inclusive of those with disabilities, uh, autism and is really looking at addressing a disadvantage in the community and creating a space for all. And I sort of feel like you, it seems like you've combined your um, incredible leadership talents, also your, your parenting, your family roles, um, so many things that you've done, and it'd be great to, to have your expertise in this panel. So welcome, Helen. Okay. And then um, another new colleague that I've had the chance to meet, um, we'd like to introduce our final member of the panel, which is Ryan Howard. And I did bump into Ryan last night, so we're both staying in the hotel, so it's great to have had a chance to quickly meet in person. Um, and Ryan is the CEO of CCAD, um, which is based down in Cork, local development company down in Cork. I know you've had many other roles in the past, as, as have many of us. Um, and so I think that's that's the main focus of your work now is really down there, Cork based, which is very good. Glad to have you up here with us for today. Um, and um, I, I think maybe I'll probably leave you around to sort of touch on how your work and CCAD's work um, uh, fits within the sort of social enterprise arena. Um, I know that there's a it's it's looking at healthy eating. That there's um, you're also supporting communities with renewable energy assets. So there's probably many things um, maximizing the use of community benefit funds. Um, and really, like all of our different uh, organisations here, trying to be a catalyst for change and for development. So welcome Ryan, welcome Helen, welcome John. Let's have a great conversation. Um, so I think, um, and I'll now just check the time, okay, and where should we go on to time-wise? Yes, okay. Um, so I think what we should do is actually, in a sense, it's it would be good to have this conversation both looking at you know, making meaning for the sector as a whole and how this is going to feed into the strategy and so on, and also telling stories or experiences from your own experiences and your own organizations. But rather than go into kind of a more extended intro, maybe we'll just, if you could weave in experiences from your own work into the, the responses to the questions or things we we're going to explore, that's probably going to be the best use of our time and an interesting way to do it. So let's really kick off with this baseline data gathering exercise, first of its kind for the social enterprise sector. The sector is growing uh, beyond its baby steps into something much more significant. So maybe we'll turn to Helen and then to Ryan. Um, so we've, we've kind of had the scene set by John. What do you, having heard all of that and seen, you know, you're probably familiar with the data collection exercise. What is the most striking ele element of it for you, Helen? Like if you look at your own organization and now that we have all this data collected, what, what stands out? I suppose the first thing that stands out is that, you know, Spree's taken a lot of those boxes, you know, in, in terms of the um, the data has been collected. But I suppose it's just that stark realisation that, uh, you know, the median um, turnover for a rural social enterprise is 50,000. Um, you know, I think that just screams out that we really need to be building capacity within all these organisations. Um, we need a lot of support. Um you know, in these rural areas so that these organizations can grow and develop and, and compete, um, you know, with, with other businesses that are there. So for me, that's the, the big standout. Um, you know, Spree was there at, at a time, you know, 12 years ago um, when we set up. But, but you know, thankfully today, um, with a lot, an awful lot of hard work and resilience and perseverance, you know, we're in the top now 25% in terms of our turnover, which was another, I suppose, standout for me as well, that, you know, we're a social 
social enterprise in, in one of the most rural parts in Ireland. And, you know, we're, we're up there with, with the, the, the best of them. So, so that, that was a standout as well. Um, certainly, you know, we're very women orientated in, in our organization, but, um, and, but I suppose in terms of our board, we're also, it's very female led as well. Um, whereas, whereas I guess a lot of others aren't, um, but, um, but yeah, listen, definitely the labor activation programs are, are key for spree. We wouldn't survive without them um so that's that's very important and and very relevant but um i suppose that presents another challenge as well in terms of the fact that we do have full employment is being able to actively compete um you know, as a social enterprise we are finding that hard you know we're competing with the hse with um with private industry and that and that's a challenge for us as well and that's in terms of employment, like the, in the terms staff of employment, yeah, and and even in terms of building that capacity as well. Um, you know, you have to be able to try. You know, if we're going to be bringing these social enterprises that have a turnover of fifty thousand and bring and bring them on, you know, they have to be able to attract, you know, key staff and be able to retain them. Um, so, you know, there's an awful lot of work to be done to be done there. But I think it's great that we have so many, and you know, we have such a volunteer network, and you know that we are. You know, we are there in rural Ireland and delivering the, these gaps in services. But I, I guess in terms of policy, that's where we need to be to be looking yeah. at. It's interesting because of your experience, in a way, you have had both both aspects. You were a smaller social enterprise and now it's so flourishing, so successful. You're it's you know, you're up there with other commercial enterprises, but there's still these challenges that you can see. And we also need to think of the the, the newer, the newer organizations, how they're gonna grow. Absolutely. But, you know, I can't tell you the amount of hard work, you know, the hours. Um, yeah, Chris referenced burnout. You know, it's it, not everybody would, would do it. Um, you know, it's 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 a it's a massive amount of work. But I suppose for, for me and for for the team in Spree, it has always been about the impact. And we can see, you know, daily, clearly the impact that we're making. So that keeps us on this journey. But, um, you know, there, there's there's definitely a balance there and that's something that has to be considered too. It's, you know, it's the time and the investment to bring a social enterprise from starting out or from that 50,000, you know, we're, we're up at about 750, 800 now you know it's it's a huge amount of 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 work and um but yeah listen it's it's all very worth it and the the thing is it's all very very doable um you know but yeah we just we just need to have the supports in place I think that's so clear and honoring the work that you and your team have done it's incredible um so yeah maybe over to you Ryan then what's what stood out to you from your perspective in terms of the baseline data uh first of all it's fantastic to be here and well done to everybody organizing this event um so far, I've learned so much. And just to say, I suppose from a local development company perspective, what's behind all of this is that one of the links that's there is over 90% of these respondents have a direct relationship with their local development company. Over 90%. And I'd say that's under a quarter. I'd say it's closer to nearly every, every one of those who are trying and getting into social enterprise, if they're not already in it, come to us because we're in, we are social enterprises. We're there 28 years. We have boards of management struggling with governance and challenges in that context. We have struggles in terms of income and generation. But we also have teams of people who work with mentoring, training, advice, guidance, business supports, non-business supports, community supports. We are that eclectic mix. Uh, have to be because we wouldn't survive either. Um, so that's what hits me, and I'd like to come back to it. I also, Helen's point there about the scale and, and that's what struck me is the average scale of this 100,000 or so up to maybe 200,000 is pittance. Look at the Scottish model. We like to compare ourselves to Scotland and we shouldn't do so because the Scots, to be fair to them, are doing some great work in this. The average Scottish, Scottish, Scottish. Um, <laughs> Scottish. There you go. Should, should hand that over. Um, uh, the average in Scotland is 800,000 pounds per, per annum. We really need to look at the scaling up and the char and again, the numbers I just is a 65 percent of less than 10 people, if I remember rightly from one of the stats. Am I right, John? So so like we need to look at this and what's stopping that scaling up? What is the issue here? And I'll come back to that if I get an opportunity later because I have some ideas uh, both in terms of scaling up and relationships. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Thanks, Ryan. I think that's a nice way to start because I, in a way, we I think we will be sort of spiraling around these same themes and going a bit deeper. So yeah, let's certainly come back to that. And yeah, turning to you, John, I was just thinking, I mean, in a way you set out this, the scene for us, but yeah, just for you personally, perhaps, or your own reflections, what, what, having done all of that, what, what does really stand out or what's top of mind right now that's important for us to know? But I suppose the income disparity piece definitely, like Helen said, comes to the fore. And I think maybe the question is, you know, if, if a real social enterprise median income is 80,000 and in an urban context is 253, why is that? And what can do about the spare questions? And why is, as you touched about this in your comment too, if you are a rural social enterprise, so if you're in a town that the average size of the population of the town is between 500 or 500 to 2,000 people, and you're in a deficient demand, down here, I'm turning out Donegal all accent. <laughs> so the accent. Um, if if you're in a, if you're in a population of a town that has even lower down, geez, I'm very loud. About here, is that good? <laughs> I'll need a table just to put it on. Um, so again, population between 500 to 2,000 people, and you're in deficient demand. So you're an organisation that, if the market had a solution, it would already have provided it. Um, that generating a trading income in a, in a rural town like that is nigh on impossible. And so it's not surprising, I suppose, in that context that so many organizations do struggle. And particularly, too, if you think about a rural social enterprise, 84% of rural social enterprises have a local focus. So they're your, your local community center type organization who are very focused on that immediate village, that immediate town, and they probably have no particular interest in going beyond that, nor should they be forced to. So two things I think we can do about that. First of all, at a policy level, we've got to acknowledge that not all social enterprises, particularly those in rural contexts, are going to be able to generate hundreds of thousands of euro trading income. Helen, I have massive, you're an outlier in, in the best possible way. I have such admiration for what you're doing. The second thing is we do have a, a role from a, a policymaking perspective, building the capacity of social enterprises to expand their market. And that's a very challenging thing to do, but there are examples. So I'm a rural social enterprise in Donegal, a tiny little community centre, who've now decided they're going to sell what would have been their typical local village charity shop wares through Thriftify. They automatically in one year, they're generating 30 grand more every year just by selling nationally. So their charity shop goods are going to Cork, they're going to Dublin, they're going to Australia. Now, that's a very simple example, and it doesn't, I suppose, encompass the complexity of the issue. But there are other examples of where social enterprises are able to branch out and sell products and service beyond their immediate remit in order to generate trading and bring other income into the local community. I suppose that's what stands out to me. Yeah, that, that's great. That's a great um, example of how I think we, we really, we seem to be circling around the same point. Like, how do we support, how do we support our fellow enterprises to, to grow that turnover so that it is sustainable and kind of creative ideas to do that? So one of the things we'd want to explore in this panel was, yeah, we looked at kind of what was striking, what stands out, but then, you know, what are real issues? And I think that's already been coming up in, in, in what you shared, Helen, and, and you, Ryan. And so maybe we could take it into, okay, if you were to pick or to go deeper on a few of the issues we've been naming, uh, John's just given a session of there's one solution an organization came up with, like, how could we solve it? How, you know, what, what's, what's a particular issue that you, you want to go a bit deeper on and any ideas on how you know, how that could be solved. And maybe coming back to you, Helen, um, if you want to take one of those points a bit further. So in terms of issues that social enterprises are facing? Ish, yeah, I yeah. think it was, you know, when you talked about your striking elements, some of those were like, oh, there's something here we need to watch out for, or we need to help our fellow enterprises with. And it's kind of, or maybe I just say that again, what's an issue that you really see, you know, budding social enterprises facing? And maybe we could go into, well, how could we help to, how could that help to be solved? Yeah, well, look, well, I mean, in terms of our own situation, like a lot of it is around, you know, time, you know, time to be able to, to do things properly. You know, we reference like social impact and stuff um, earlier, and that always seems to get pushed to the to the bottom of everything that you're doing. But really, it should be to the to the fore, um, you know, so I, I guess it's it's about providing the support so that, you know, social enterprises realize the importance of, you know, being aware of their social impact. Um, you know, last year, the, the department ran a really good initiative called Arise, you know, about bringing awareness of social enterprises, you know, across the country. And I mean, that was that was fantastic because most people did not understand what a social enterprise was. Um, and, you know, certainly in terms of, of where, where Spree is locally, you know, we did an awful lot of great work um, there and, and as did, did throughout Donegal. So I suppose maybe something like, like that again, so that maybe the departments could support 
you know, social enterprises to be able to articulate their social impact much better um, because then, you know, that will, you know, will have knock on effects because people will realize the importance, um, you know, of that. And I suppose Arise probably did that to a certain extent. But I think, you know, we do, we definitely need to do more in terms of um, the, the social impact piece. And then I suppose then it's just about maybe learning from from one another as well. I mean, there's there's really great examples of, you know, initiatives that are happening, you know, across the country. So maybe it's maybe trying to pilot or pilot some of those in, in different areas or, you know, you know, maybe encouraging social enterprises in Donegal to, you know, try out something that's happening in Cork or Kerry and, you know, build their capacity that way. Mm, thank you. It's actually just sparked a, a memory for me. I was just thinking about this, uh, even the awareness raise. We're at a stage where in society, we may not even all know what a social enterprise really is. And I am a member of a, a community hub up in Laos where I am and going in there to rent a desk and so on. And the director at one point said to me, oh, Ali, have you ever thought of, you might be into a social enterprise or, you know, looking at my work, you know, so she, she kind of raised my awareness. If she hadn't said that, I wouldn't have started to think about it. So there's so many different ways in to, to help with this. Ryan, how about you in terms of issues or and ways that they could be tackled? Yeah, um, I, I have five. I have a secret. Okay, well, my secret. Minute, three minutes. My, my secret notebook here, and I have a solution as well. So just as <laughs> so far as we, um, uh, legal structures, we talked about it earlier. We need to be more complex because community is complex. The issues are complex. We can't be simply pushing people into the same legal structure and saying that's where that that's what everybody fits into. First one. Apparently, we have to. Re even though this, this this research suggests not to, I would suggest we have to. The, uh, the visibility of the sector, I absolutely agree with everything there, the, the support and to the networks and, and getting more discussion on and getting it on mainstream TV and mainstream um, and, you know, social media to get out there and talk a lot more about our social media, our social enterprises, because people don't know. Uh, I had a conversation recently with um, a procurement officer who taught a social enterprise was a uh, social network. It was, um, you know, the equivalent of Google or, Facebook. Net, you know, Facebook, yeah. So that's what that's what they're and he's a procurement officer. So not not to mention where he comes from. Um, the, the financial side of things, absolutely financing. We talked about it earlier in terms of and it's different modelling. Like for your for your uh, meals and wheels, the critical things are CSP type programs. We've four hundred and thirty of those. This is a disgrace. Four hundred and thirty for the whole country. There should be one in every village and town. Full stop. Absolutely, everybody who understands what I'm saying, it's critical. We should have one in every village and town. When it comes to the larger the organizations of procurement, we talked about it there. Not, not only should we have a procurement, um, as we have statements of procurement from government, we should have targets, a minimum of 10%. Imagine if we all had a minimum of 10% of our local government and say even local development contracts being sold to enterprises. Crikey, we, we could actually change this in the next four or five years. Why not? Be ambitious, be out there. The other parts, that I, I suppose, my other two parts, and I'm really quickly, um, are, are really about the lack of cohesion. There's a lot of really good work going on here. But when it comes to it, the social enterprises come to us confused. Are they supposed to go to Leo? Are they supposed to go to the Enterprise Ireland? Are they supposed to go to here, there, and everywhere? And we are barely resourced to do this. But it's on top of our leader. It's on top of our PSYCAP. It's actually additional. We stretch ourselves to make sure we're there for social enterprises. But it's a joke. The funding we have for the resourcing, I don't know if you know, but the maximum we can give to a social enterprise is 2,500 euros. 2,500 euros. That's usually like a few weeks of running costs of a decent social enterprise. That's not a sport. That's that's. A, we should be putting the equivalent of what we put into the, the the into Leos into a social enterprise only dedicated, local development driven. I'm going to talk about ourselves now. I'm selling selling the local development sector as a platform to that, for that. Forty four million euros a year goes into Leos. What do we get? I won't tell you. This is embarrassing. Is that okay? Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, so turning to you, John, maybe some the same thing is uh, in terms of any like particular issues. Anything further to say? I know you've actually already started to to share some and solutions. Just just very quickly on the social procurement piece because it seems to be top of mind for everybody at the minute, and people talk about the all island social procurement market or the procurement market's about fifteen billion, and why aren't we tapping into that? And, you know, Chris, in fairness to Manison's doing great work around by social, but identifying organizations who are interested in procurement and credit to Chris and the ICE team for doing that. The challenge being is when you actually granularly go down into it, into the social enterprises, who are creating products and services that are actually procurable by organizations that are wanting to social procure now? And the answer is a tiny amount, a tiny amount. 
And just to give you, I suppose, a comparison in the UK, uh, Social Enterprise UK have been running a buy social campaign for about six years now, and they've got about a thousand social enterprises to benefit from social procurement contracts. But there's a hundred thousand social enterprises in the UK. So if you translate that into an Irish context, that would be just over forty social enterprises over six years benefiting from social procurement. Now, why is that? Two reasons. One. In Ireland, social, social enterprises tend not to be set up to sell products and services that are procurable. So we can either say, that's it, there's no market here, or we can say, how do we build the capacity of social enterprises to build adjacent markets for themselves? So it might not it might be a slow process getting them into food and beverage, get them into fast moving consumer whatever that printing is a really obvious example and there are one or two social enterprises in ireland who are doing that really well that needs to be universal the local development companies have a huge role maybe they're in taking leadership on that being a social procurement social enterprise themselves potentially but it's it's a space that needs an awful lot of capacity building and the very last one because i'm conscious of time is around labor market activation programs so we all know 60 percent of social enterprises who are paid staff are using them 65 percent in a rural area a community center 90 plus percent big reliance on labor market activation pro pro uh, programs. The problem right now is you can't get people on them. You can't get people through TUS. You can't get people through RSS. You can't get people on CE. The training grant, the materials grant, they haven't moved in 10 years despite inflation. So effectively, they're trying to do much more with less. And a point that was raised in the, in the first um, uh, by Susie Khan, if you've got uh, full employment, which is great, and look, we have to commend that, there are still 60,000 people who are long-term unemployed. To get them on to a TUS program, they have much more acute needs, much more acute training needs. And so to get them up to a, a level of capability and skill that they can then have a positive impact in the social enterprise, that's a lot of work. And by the time they get to that level, they have to go because the program's over. So we have to do something about acknowledging those programs are vital. They serve a need for the state in terms of long-term unemployment, skill, upskilling those people, their confidence, their sense of purpose. But social enterprises are trying to do so with two hands tied behind their back right now, and policy needs to change to reflect that. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, John. And thank you for the chance to extend the conversation in this way. I'm wondering where, in a way, we had an area that we wanted to explore in, the, in this conversation, which connects to social procurement, and maybe it can go a bit broader. You know, we've just gone into that area. So just to see if there's further reflections for, for any of you. So basically, the, the, the area we wanted to explore was how can social enterprises help rural Ireland actually take advantage of all these emerging opportunities. So we were just talking about social procurement, there's remote working, there's new technologies, there's probably all sorts of other things. So I don't know exactly how that sits in the context of each of your organizations, but just to open that out, if that sparks anything, maybe going back to Helen again. Yeah, look, look for us, it was, it's, you know, your rural regeneration plays a huge part in everything that we do. And for us, it's a, a lot of it was around regenerating vacant buildings. Um, I think we're on to building number 10 now in Carndona. So, you know, that that's massive for an organization to do that. Um, but, you know, we've we're, you know, greatly supported, obviously, by leader funding and from the department and, and that as well. And I guess we've been really lucky, too, in that, um, you know, a lot of our landlords um, all had a social conscience and, you know, don't crucify us in, in, you know, rent, which has been great. But we have transformed the town of Carndona in terms of being able to go into 10 different um, buildings that probably still would be vacant if we weren't there. So I suppose that's, you know, a really good example that, you know, could probably be rolled out, you know, um, across the country. And um, it's it's worked incredibly well um, for us. So absolutely, you know, we we, we have the co-working hub, um, we're, you know, we have a lovely digital creative lab. So we're, we're certainly bringing digital technology to Karen Donna too. And we're also, you know, now embracing, I suppose, the, the sustainable um, and the, the climate piece as well. We have our charity shop, which uh, generates considerable income that we use then to deliver services. And we've just added now furniture restoration um, piece to that as well. So we're going to revamp furniture and sell that on to and try and keep everything within um, as much as we can within the circular economy, working really closely with the Rediscovery Centre in Dublin. So again, you know, it's just about taking I suppose, you know, a lot of the stuff is working and we've referenced Scotland and stuff there as well, you know, but uh, there's great ideas throughout the country. And I suppose it's just trying to, you know, get them going in different parts of Ireland. We don't need to be reinventing the wheel, you know, take what's working really well and, you know, and, and roll it out there. And yeah, let's keep rural Ireland uh, flourishing and, and thriving. And uh, yeah, and it's, it's great. Here, here. Thank you, Helen. Wonderful. Wonderful to hear all that. Um, yeah, other ideas, Ryan. Yeah. 
what more can I say? It's, yeah. it's, it's there, you know. <laughs> but what I would say is that um, we're, 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 we're uh, local development companies at the moment are going through a fantastic period of consultations on the ground to SICAP and leader. I, I, and I was struck, um, uh, I was talking to somebody just earlier, I was struck with the number of people who talked about loneliness, talked about isolation, and this is across the board, age-wise, gender, you know, um, uh, new communities, old communities, you know, people talk about separation. We don't have the connectivity that we used to have, rural or urban. Uh, market towns are kind of, you know, that's those structures, the urban town structures, everything is just dissipating. And what we really do need innovation. And I believe, and I know, if we release this horse, I think it's it, we're, we're tying it down so much. We're trying to over-prescribe maybe a little bit while we're looking for policy to support it. We need to open that up as well. Like I talked about in terms of legal structures, really consider it in the context of it can be what it needs to be. It can be what it needs to be on the ground for that person, for that group. It needs not to be tied up in legal structures and then pushed into a charitable status and then having the required SORP and everything else that will absolutely blow you away in terms of administration before. You, so you take yourself away from what you have actually set up for in the first place and just to do the administration, you get the grant. We can't do that. We've got to be really careful. But it's a huge opportunity. And I think it's fantastic timing, um, I believe. And listening to young, younger people, younger and older, actually, talking about looking for a new model, a new way, a new age, looking at it differently. I, I, I just, I'm, 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 I'm delighted after the last eight or nine months, I'm re-energized. You know, there's a, there's a crop of people coming at us saying, we can do this, we, can, we need to do this. And they're coming with different accents, different colors, different creeds. And that's in New Ireland. I think that's what I'm, I'm, but it needs to be opened, not closed. It needs to be really open, open to definition and open to inclusion and in every community, in every village. And not closed. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. It needs to be open. And this is a new Ireland. Yeah. Um, John, anything? I know we were sort of touching on the social procurement already. Is there anything else in terms of the sort of emerging opportunities or we can move into, there's a kind of final area I'd like to explore as well. No, it's just, I suppose you can come back to, to something that Chris said in the last talk to you about uh, post 08 when, when unemployment figures were right. Social enterprise played a role there in terms of providing meaning, purpose, job activation or labor activation for people. You know, we're, we're moving into a world now where we're seeing task encroachment due to emerging technology. And that that conversation is going to get very, very real very quick. I know there's not there's an awful lot of saber rattling about it at the minute, but it is meaningfully coming down the line and about skilled jobs maybe becoming less and less viable. Social enterprise needs to jump into that space because we are a labor intensive uh, type of sector. We are a sector that values people over profit. And that's that's a space we need to get into. But the other thing is, I think we need to lose our modesty just for a while, because if Google or Kerry Group or Facebook or any of these people decided they were social impact first and redistributed their profits and had an asset lock and were accountable to the local community, they'd have a ticker tape parade down O'Connell Street. And that would be the best thing, but they'd be getting so much coverage for it. Social enterprises, four and a half thousand of them in this country are doing that every single day of the week and nobody knows about it. So I think we need to lose our modesty and we need to shout about what we're doing and then ask for government and public support on the back of that. Great, here, here again. So just, just hold on to that for a moment, John, because I'm going to move into the just the final question here, which is kind of coming back to all the data that we have, which in a way, and that's a part of people really knowing about what's going on, is that we actually have numbers to show, we actually have a story to tell with some data to back it up. And so, you know, again, just to restate that this has been a significant step, that this has been done, and any kind of learnings on... Are there any other data sources that we would want to access that we haven't here, other ones that we could be using for a further, you know, the next round of the data collection, anything else that we would evolve or change in terms of how we actually do that kind of crucial data collection for the sector? And maybe just starting with you, John, as a certainly the expert in getting this all to happen. Just, just one quick one, which would be make, making sure that there's as many intermediaries as possible involved in the process. Like it's, it's some organizations are very forthcoming with data, others are, are, are less so. Clarifying the definition of social enterprise, a lot of people were probably under reporting numbers because they weren't quite sure what the definition was. So I think the next time around, we've got to reflect that. The other thing which we can actually do with the existing data set, but definitely for the next time is county by county data, because for the likes of the local development companies, having that granular level of detail allowed to them to have respond to, to county by county needs. And I'll leave it at that. Great. Yeah, we'll keep going. Helen, how about for you? Yeah, listen, I, I just think, you know, going forward, if we can, you know, if we can demonstrate what the learnings are out of this data, 
you know, so that when we go to do, you know, a second survey or, or whatever, that that might be that people can see the benefit of of actually taking part, um, you know, that we can demonstrate, I suppose, positive outcomes now out of out of the learnings from from this one. Wonderful. I'm going to say something now. It's probably going to freak out every local development company in the country. But here's what I think, uh, and I see it. I see the frustrations in terms of gathering data. We just come off the back. I just mentioned there of a whole bunch of nine months of consultations. Every little community, every little group, everybody we could possibly talk to who had any interest in development came to us. We went to them. They didn't come to us. We're not alone. Every local development company, 48 of us across the country, have done that. That connection will not stop. We're actually now a hub, a web, information is flowing in and out of us. I would offer that we should be the platform on which that data continues to build. Why not have a social inclusion officer within every local development company whose job it is to actually collect that data on an ongoing basis? Why not build up the communication process within those 48 sites? Why not use those 48 sites as the space that you direct people into? You get the information from and you gain a trust within. Does that make sense? Of course it does. Let's use the platforms we have. Don't have to reinvent the wheel, department, everybody, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, I think maybe what we'll do is move into, open it up to the floor and just see if there's other points coming in and, and um, uh, make it a wider conversation. And again, in a true form, I'm going to turn to our online uh, colleagues first because we feel you're a little bit far away, but we know you're there. So there's one um, comment here in the chat from um, Megan Flynn Dixon. So this is going back to, I think it was a, a, quite a theme in our discussion about around the social procurement. So related to that in particular, how do we guide businesses so I guess existing businesses who want to develop a social enterprise arm of their operations to do so in in a market sector that is that is needed. Um, so yeah, any reflections on so it's an existing business and they want to do that, but how do we kind of direct them in the right direction where the need is greatest? Yeah, very quickly, I think the first thing we need to do is we need to open up business supports to social enterprises. There's too many of them are getting the local enterprise office door closed in their faces. We need to stop that because if you have anything that looks like a feasibility study or you, you can't have that closed in your face, trading online vouchers, all that needs to be available to social enterprises. The second thing is there are a lot of initiatives that are going on right now, identifying social procurement opportunities. Again, food and beverage is a big one, uh, printing, government supply, all that. So there's loads of opportunities. Ourselves, I see loads of, there's loads of projects out there. We need to get people more aware of what's out there because there are loads of opportunities. Like yesterday, Day somebody called me saying I have a hundred grand to spend in the social enterprise sector on food and beverage. Can you point me in the way of social enterprises? And surprisingly, there are very little. There are very little who are in that space, but there are people who could be in that space, uh, and it's up to us to connect them. Any other other reflections, or we can open to more questions? Yeah, I'll, shall, shall we, let's open it out to the floor. Um, so yes, so thanks for online and now in person. Yes, wonderful, William. Thanks very much, uh, William Parnell. I currently work um, on a part-time basis providing advice to some social enterprises. Um, we've heard a lot this morning about social procurement. And in the earlier panel discussion, I think the emphasis was on public procurement. And indeed, as I think most people in the room will know, there's been a huge emphasis on public procurement and opportunities for social enterprises in that space. But we also equally know the complexity of public procurement and the, the bureaucracy of public procurement. And I often wonder whether the private procurement market is overlooked. In other words, the business to business um, supply uh, from social enterprises to larger businesses in the economy. And so I just wonder if um, the current panel has any views on, on that as an opportunity for social enterprises. You spoke, John, earlier about social enterprises expanding their market, and I think that's really um, a, a great area of opportunity, but specifically around what we might call the business-to-business -business procurement and what would be needed then for social enterprises to avail of that opportunity and to grow it. Thanks. Great. Thank you, William. Absolutely. It's, there's definitely a market there, but I think it just boils back to the fact that a lot of social enterprises just don't have the capacity 
within their organizations to be able to develop those relationships and take it to the next stage. So maybe it, it boils back to what you're saying that, you know, there should be resources within perhaps the, the partnership companies across um, the country so that that support can be there um, to help social enterprises develop, you know, those those networks and relationships. Because if we're saying that the median turnover of most rural enterprises is um, somewhere between 50 and 80,000 euro, they're probably all volunteer led. Um, with people with limited time and availability to develop um, that that type of that, that type of uh, relationship to get those um, contracts. So I think it definitely, you know, we have to build capacity within the social enterprises in rural Ireland. But to do that, you know, we need, uh, you know, as you said, the support of an organisation such as Leo is to the SME. Great question. What does two parts of this answer? Um, first of all. Most social enterprises that we work with, uh, I'm only talking about the ones I know of personally myself, uh, they depend on, on, on at least two customers, one being the public and the others maybe the private. So it, it goes both ways. We need to not just kind of say, well, let's move to us. I agree with you. I, I agree that there's an opportunity there, but we need to also have the capacity within that space, within that confine, within that place, to have an interaction, first of all, to meet with those procurement officers, public and private, and I'm offering again the platform of local development companies for that, because we do it. We do it. We've done. We've done it for food businesses, micro enterprises, for community enterprises. Why not for social enterprises? And actually gain that education and, and, and learning and understanding both with the market and with the provider. And also this idea that uh, I, I, we've seen some private um, companies going in that direction, but the scale of what they're offering, just like I said, there is often beyond any individual social enterprise. But the idea of actually local networks bringing people together, hubs, a social enterprise hub within every local development organization, working with the networks, working with the, the procurers, and doing that on a maybe twice yearly basis. Real practical ways of actually doing that. But it needs, it needs to be resourced in itself. Great. If you could just hold on to that for, for me for a moment. Um, thank you, Ryan. Thank you all. Um, thank you, William, for that question. And just to say there's also support for that with our online participants, um, our colleague, Andrew Ford. Hi, Andrew. Great to, to have you with us. Um, just also saying real support for that idea and also saying, you know, we could also have social ent enterprises preferentially buying from other social enterprises. You could do it that way around as well. So another another question. Yeah. I just, uh, just, uh, just one point I want to make is that uh, the average uh, income or uh, income yeah, for uh, small uh, social enterprises out in the country uh, is eighty uh, thousand a year. Now we our income for is eighty thousand a year, but if we were asked, uh, what are your assets? We are in existence for thirty years, and I can tell you our assets are about ten million. So the what I'm trying to say is that the income of eighty thousand bears no resemblance at all to the achievements of those same small income earning social enterprises. And that's the second, we need to do a second round of, a second round of research to really see, and I've been around the country, the, to the four provinces, you know what I mean? And, and I've, I've visited people, I've listened to them and I've listened to their histories and I've listened to their achievements. And of course we need help. We need help, but we need, we need a different type of help now. We need to go from where we are to the next level, you know, and that will require a lot of money now. To require more money, like, you know, because the more you do, the more any social enterprise achieves, it opens up another load of opportunities. And then you go higher, and it's why the, 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 the higher you go, the, the greater the number of opportunities. So I just wanted, before I go home, I just want to make sure that you're well aware. And I, I don't know who am I talking to? I'm talking to the people who are doing all this, like, you know, so, but, the story of social enterprise has yet to be told. It has yet to be told. It is the most important thing in this country at this point in time, pre-COVID, Ukrainian crisis, uh, if the government are going down into communities to look for help, and that's where the help is. That's And the, the people who know the problems, know the solutions, implement the solutions, and own the solutions, and they own them for the rest of their lives. So we get a we get up a leader we get a, a we get a capital grant of a leader to start up something and we might get a capital grant in later on, but but we in the community we run that social enterprise for the rest of our lives. The government are getting a fantastic deal of a communities volunteers in communities who take it on as like a GA club. It keeps going from one generation to the other. As long as what we're doing in the community is a benefit to the community, as long as it's a benefit to the community, 
you you will get private enterprises to close down when they run into trouble. You will never get a social enterprise that's still good in a community that's closed down because the community won't allow it to close down. And we are going with 30 years and it's better and better and more and more and more. Of course, more and more money we need, more and more help we need. I only wanted to make that point. Thank you for that powerful point. I'm really sitting with that. Social enterprises are a story waiting to be told. And I think also what you were saying is it's not just about income. The actual, those assets are huge. And it, for me, it reminds me of how we started with Helen talking about, you know, really touching in on the amount of labor, the amount of human time and care it takes to build these organizations, these offerings for a community over a whole, the lifetime of the organization. And uh, that needs to be supported, that needs to be known about, that needs to be allowed to flourish. Um, so I think with that, I think that is a, a, a perfect final word for us to feel sort of resonating in ourselves. We all know it. We want this story to be told more widely and for this uh, incredible work to just really grow and flourish and be supported to be all that it can be. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank our amazing second panel, uh, John Logue, Helen Nolan, Ryan Howard. Thank you so much for inspiring us with this conversation, allowing us to really explore this and enrich our learning on this uh, theme today. Thank you. Great. So, um, yes, yeah, so thanking our uh, panel and I can see there's a little bit of movement going on. There's things happening here. And um, as I said, we were, sh were shortly going to be saying goodbye to our online, uh, online colleagues, but not quite yet. So I just want to, I'm just going to check that we're all set up yet. So I just want to hand back to Robert Nicholson, our director, uh, to close. Thank you. Okay, folks, if you don't mind, I'm going to speak directly to the online crew here because um, Yep, yep, you'll be you'll be staying. So, um, folks, you'll be leaving us now. We are going into a discussion forums around rural proofing the strategy with the audience here, um, because of the novel way we've arranged this today in in, in, in dual with yourselves online and people uh, in the room today. We just took the opportunity while we have bums on seats to try and get an extra bit of glut out of the audience. So, just to say to you before you go, um, thanks very much for 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 signing on today and and bearing with us. Um, we'll circulate any of the material that we develop out of the day to you through the email that you left on Eventbrite. If you have anything you want to suggest to us, propose or material for us to read that you think might uh, add to our thoughts, you can send it to, to rural.strategy at drcd.ie. Rural.strategy at drcd.ie. Um, in terms of what I've heard today, folks, uh, far and wide in terms of issues, but basically we're in the foothills of where we need to be. Um, key issues are around procurement and social clauses, governance and expertise, social impact measurement, and income itself being no measure of success. Um, reliance on active labour market programmes for particular uh, cohorts of social enterprises, the likes of communications and getting an identifiable um, uh, understanding of what social enterprises are, really big. And that Please place around social enterprises being confused by the uh, public policy framework and maybe something like a who does what type website or central resource so you can identify where it is you need to go to, to get particular supports. Um, one key thing that jumped out at me, which is my own thought and one of, one of the few uh, own thoughts I've had today based on the experts in the room, there was a huge amount of um, um, commentary around or a significant amount of commentary around the diversity of the sector. I can tell you one thing that the sector has communally is drive, uh, ideas, ambition. It is, and I've done many of these sessions, as you can imagine, as a public servant, but it was like a, a kind of warm wind hitting me talking to individuals in here this morning in terms of the amount of ideas they had, the speed at which they wanted to communicate them, and the amount of organisations that they were involved in. I don't think I've spoken to one person here today that was less than, than was involved with less than three or four uh, organisations, uh, boards and so on. So we're really, really strong. You can tell your social entrepreneurs. I can tell as a, as a public servant um, who has a little bit of a different framework to work within that that absolutely is a strength of the sector. Um, so I think that should be focused on a little bit more. Just closing off and again to the online people, particular thanks. We have some bodies online. And uh, again, I was a little bit worried about the workability of it and how well it would come across. I'm hearing some very positive feedback around uh, 
the cameraman here who's run things so efficiently this morning, uh, and also the hosting of the event in terms of keeping the conversational wheels greased. Not that it needed too much uh, greasing, I think. Um, so that's it, guys. We'll sign off. Um, one final thought for myself, I suppose, we've been concentrating on social enterprise here this morning, and I, again, come, are, I'm living in a small community out in Foynes and Shannon Golden in West Limerick. I have just the impression over the last number of years, I exited the sector for a while, but I have an impression over the last number of years that there's been great progress. If we look at the likes of the hub strategy, if we look at our concentration around town centre first and grants for buildings and so on, and the likes of social enterprise, that there is much more of a significant kind of coherent movement towards the kind of rural economies and making sure that town centres and so on can bring the whole vibrancy of rural communities together. Um, again, in the foothills of it, in a lot of spaces, but if, if communities generally have people like yourselves, and no doubt like yourselves, L9, uh, demanding uh, of government so that ye can deliver, I think we're in a pretty good place. So again, thanks for your time. Bodies online, we'll send you material and again, get back to us. And I'm told to stick this up. If you can read it, rural.strategy at drcd.gov.ie. All right. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Great. So um, thank you very much to everyone online. As, um, as Rob was saying, I'm just going to quickly save the chat. And I think what I'll do now is um, actually maybe we can have a quick moment to see those of you. Oh, OK. Most people got cameras off. I can see a few people there. I might just if you if you're happy to put your camera on, I might um, I'm just going to put you up on the screen so we can say a little goodbye to anyone who's still there. I can see you there, Brendan, uh, Philip, Karen, Mary, and I know we had many others with us as well. So thanks a lot and bye bye to those who are online um, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. So I will end.